Welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. During the last legislative session, Vermont had a record number of out LGBTQ candidates running for office. We had 15 candidates. And of those 15, 13 got elected. A fair portion of those, this is their first session. They are first time legislators. I just thought maybe we'd start checking in with them and see how it's going. So for today, we have Representative Kate Donnelly from Lamoille 2, which is the greater Hyde Park area. Welcome, Kate. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be back here with you. Well, well it's good to see that you're still standing. <laughs> so it, this was your first session, and, and I realized that because of COVID, it's sort of a little different than what most legislature, legislators encounter, but what has it been like for you? What were some of the unexpected issues that you had to deal with as a first time legislator? Oh man, well, I, I mean, in terms of COVID, um, you know, I think, I, I think that it's just made it really, you know, more challenging to build those connections and those, and those relationships that are so essential to to doing this work. I do, however, feel really blessed. As you said, I came in with a really incredible crew of new folks, and we actually did a lot of work during the, our campaigns, our respective campaigns, to build connection with each other. And so I've come in with a really great group, and we've established really strong relationships. And so it's actually kind of interesting. Those relationships... Uh, have been um, have offered incredible guidance to me. Whereas I think if I'd been in the state house, there would have been much heavier influence from folks who've been around for a long time. So it just creates an interesting dynamic where it certainly limits some of what um, we can learn and some of the work that we can do and access to folks like yourself and others who have their own ideas of the work we should be doing. But um, in a way, it's also freed up a little bit of space for some of us newcomers to forge alliances with each other and, and think about what we want the work to look like. How, how has the remote access impacted your ability to stay connected with your constituents? Because I know I can go in and look at meetings, you know, after the fact, but I can't walk into the state house and have immediate contact with you? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And it's a question that I would love to pose to my constituents. You know, I mean, I think from my perspective, I've just been working really hard to do the best I can to be accessible. And um, we have been doing monthly, uh, we being Dan Noise is my sort of, uh, my colleague, we, I'm a two rep district. Um, and we do monthly Zoom community meetings, and those have actually been really well attended. Um, and it's this, you know, again, with, with these COVID dynamics, it's this sort of like double-edged sword where on the one hand, it limits access in certain ways, for sure. And on the other hand, I feel like it's opened up doors of access in other ways. You know, I think if we were doing Monday morning coffee at the local cafe, I don't know if we'd have 30 people show up, but we do on a Saturday on Zoom. And so... Um, you know, we've just been trying to get creative. I, I will say that we're pretty excited. You know, our slate of Tuesday Night Live and Wednesday Night Live and these things are picking back up again. And I do think there's some huge, like, size of relief and excitement to get back out there and just connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. It, it also is starting to sound a little bit like your time as a legislator there is, there is a greater demand on your time. It, is it more so than what you thought was going to be required? Oh man, that's a, that's a great question. You know, it's funny when I was, uh, during the campaign, uh, talking to my wife, I kept being like, 
I know, I know. It's like a lot right now, but we're just going to get through this. And then, and then it's going to ship. And she was like, ha, 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 ha. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. It's not going to, like, she was on it from day one. And then, of course, you know, it started. And then I was like, oh, but now it's just the beginning. And so, of course, it's a lot because, you know, and she's like, mm-hmm, no. You know, I think on some level, clearly she knew. And on some level, I think I knew just what a significant um, commitment of time this was going to be. And, and like, you know, like I'm saying in this story, it's not just my time. You know, it's a family commitment. It's the kids and the wife and, the you know, it's, everyone really has to be invested in this work. And I feel really blessed to have such a supportive partner in this because I honestly don't know how I'd be able to do it without that support. You know, we talk about it, you know, among the, again, that, that crew of new legislators, we talk a lot, a lot of them are um, parents of young kids or are, you know, younger. And we talk about just what an incredible impact it is on our lives and, and, and thinking about it from an equity perspective and thinking about who do we want representing us and, and are the people that we really want representing us able to have access to this work? Because it's really difficult. It's difficult. You have to have a very flexible job. You have to have support in, you know, in your home or in your community and not everybody has those things. And so just thinking about, you know, how do we make this work more accessible so that we can keep bringing in really solid representation, you know? So do you feel as though you're getting the support of your community, both, both your geographic community and the LGBTQ plus communities? Yeah, I think I, I felt really supported. You know, I mean, I think I think the community, I feel really grateful to live in an engaged community. I get a lot of correspondence from folks and um, on, on all sides of every issue. And I, I really appreciate that. I, I appreciate the dialogue and the, and the engagement. And I mean, you know, the queer folks that I've come in to the legislature with have been, you know, some of hands down the people who have, have made this <laughs> feel possible, who've brought humor, who've brought joy, who've brought love, you know, it's been a pretty incredible thing to come in to this work, um, feeling, you know, surrounded by a bunch of other really incredible queer folks. So you were assigned to the House Judiciary Committee. Was that the committee that you had hoped for? It is, yeah, it was my number one choice. Okay. Thank you, Jill Kerwinski. <laughs> so, so I noticed going on to the committee's page, you had 75 bills assigned to your committee just for this year. And of the 75, there were 14 that you have acted on, including both the House and what you got from the Senate that needed action. What was the committee process like deciding which of those 75 bills were going to be a priority? It's a great question. And I, I will just say the committee work has been hands down my favorite part of the legislative experience. You know, that's, an, I mean, Zoom house floor is not exactly <laughs> an enjoyable experience. Um, but the committee work somehow, even in Zoomland, has, has, has been a really um, fulfilling experience. And I, you know, I, I give a tremendous amount of, of credit and I have a tremendous amount of respect for our chair, um, Maxine Grad. Um, and I've, you know, in terms of how do we, how has it been decided, you know, we moved 11 bills before crossover. That's a, that's a lot. And you know, I've I've reached out to Maxine and said, man, when when this session is over and we have some time, like I would love to understand. It's like choreography. You know, she's like a choreographer back there. And each of these bills has its own life, and you never really know what turn it's going to take. And you know, so to to sort of expertly maneuver eleven bills before crossover, I think it was a, a testament to her leadership and her understanding of the process. She's been doing this a really long time, and I also think it's a testament. To the committee, I think we have a really solid group of folks, um, tripartisan representation on that committee, and I think we all we all work really well together. Um, yeah, so you know, 
to, to, to answer your question in terms of how is it decided, I think Maxine really set the table, but she does that collaboratively. And I think a lot of it was, you know, these are themes that have been carried through from past years. These are saying a lot of in judiciary, it's a lot of like, we have this broader, you know, justice initiative, and we know it's not going to, it's going to take far more than one session to do this. And so, okay, here's the first round and then here's the second round. And then here's the, you know, so um, I think it's really guided by the overall themes of what we're trying to work on. And, and she just sort of mass, you know, she's the puppet master back there making it all happen. And, and you can never anticipate how one phrase or one word within a bill can all of a sudden change the direction you're going in and what you thought you were doing such as when you worked on the bias and hate crimes bill to remove the term maliciously intended. Thank you so much. But what, what are the bills that you worked on in House Judiciary that passed out that you're really proud of the work that you did? You know, there's, I think there's so many you know, I, it's funny because I've I've said to folks like I think sometimes politicians want to shy away from like hot button contentious issues, and I've learned that with judiciary, every single bill you're working on is a hot button contentious issue, which I which I love. Um, and so from that respect, I mean, every single theme we've worked on has been really um, important to me. I would say collectively, one of the most powerful experiences has certainly been H-128, which is the bill that was um, co-sponsored by uh, Rep. Mari Cordes and, and Taylor Small, and that was um, banning um, the LGBTQ plus panic defense. Um, and that was a beautiful experience for, you know, just all the way through in terms of, you know, you have you have Taylor coming in, first trans legislator. Um, this is like the first, you know, bill gets picked up by committee. And again, you know, chair grad created a really open space where Mari and, and Taylor really were um, members of the committee as we were working on this. And so there was, you know, just representation and access and, um, and I think that really carried through. I know it had, you know, some stumbling blocks in, in the Senate, but ultimately, again, you know, Taylor was welcome to the table and just did a phenomenal job of advocacy. And, um, and then to have it ultimately pass out of both bodies unanimously, I think, is just an incredible thing. Um, it really is a beautiful thing on so many levels. And you think about, like, how many people were involved in that process and how many, you know, I think it, as clunky as things got it and the painful at times as things got, I think at every turn when we could have gone in a variety of directions, people kept choosing to, you know, validate our lives. And I think that was a pretty, pretty beautiful thing. So you said that the committee is just by the virtue of the issues you're dealing with, you get the hot button issues. One of the bills for which I'm getting a lot of questions about is H-145, which is the use of force bill with law enforcement. And during the last session, there was an absolute ban on law enforcement using chokeholds. When this bill went through the session this year, there was a provision put in that sort of gave an exception that in an instance where deadly force was deemed appropriate, that an officer wouldn't be prosecuted if they used a chokehold. Can, can you explain to people a little bit about how that happened and why the committee chose that specific link? Sure. You know, so H-145 is the bill that you're referring to. And this is another one of those that I was kind of referencing earlier, where we're talking about, you know, efforts that were made in the last session um, where there was, all, you know, finally a large sort of surge of support for some from serious law enforcement reform. And so, you know, riding that surge, they passed um, legislation restricting use of force and, and a number of other things. And 
that moved very quickly. And so I think as part of the dynamic, this is my understanding, is that as part of the dynamic last year of moving this rather quickly or last biennium, um, you know, as always, there was some negotiation essentially with law enforcement who were saying, look, you know, there's some pieces of this we're really concerned about in terms of training people and also just in terms of like the sanctity of our lives and um, and so some like functional issues. And I think there was sort of this like grand barter essentially that was like, we're going to pass this thing through and, but we're going to keep coming back to it and we're going to keep looking at it. And so um, H145 was that next sort of round of coming back and saying, okay, what are the areas that you're struggling with here and how can we keep working on getting this right? Um, and so I think, you know, the, the, it is tricky, and I, I understand it, but it's covered in the press as, you know, like the legislature's loosening the chokehold ban. And, 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 you know, we are to some degree in the sense that we're creating a, there is a carve out that was created. But I think essentially what we heard in testimony was, um, you know, there are moments where police officers' lives are, are put at risk, where they, there is a very real imminent threat of death. And the concern was that um, with the total ban, that um, essentially we were removing any um, form of defense that a police officer could use that didn't involve their firearm. So it was sort of creating a scenario where the only way to defend your life was to use your firearm or some other form of weapon. And I think that felt like a, a compelling argument. We heard testimony from you know, the NAACP, we heard testimony from a lot of advocate groups. And, you know, I, it's, it's funny to say 145 is actually, um, I can't say it's my favorite bill, but I would say it's a bill that in some ways I was most proud of in the sense that um, it was a hard bill. And we had a lot of different people involved. And it was a bill that there was a point on a Friday where we were talking about this bill and Maxine was, and it was like, you know, possible vote on the agenda. And Maxine was like, we're just going to take a week. And within that week, you know, a lot of work was done. And actually on the final day of the vote, we were still like wrestling with um, some language around law enforcement and they really wanted certain language put in. And we really didn't want to put that language in and, there was a moment where I was like looking at the portion of the bill they were talking about. And I was like, you know, that section is really like a lens that we're seeing this work through. What if we just moved that number five up to number one, like would that resolve this issue? And all of a sudden, like the whole thing came together and we passed it out of committee 11 And so it was just one of these sort of, you know, I know it's a painful bill for a lot of people and I'm not trying to make light of the, the content of the bill, but sometimes in this work, you know, we have to make hard and, and somewhat incremental changes, and it takes a lot of effort and, and compromise. And, and that was one of those bills where I think people really came together and did some hard work. It, it truly sounds like it. So thank you. So as the session is starting to wind down, what are your hopes for next year? Since it's, you know, a bicameral system, you're going to have year two to pick up what you couldn't really finish in year one, both in judiciary, but the legislature in general. What, what are you really hoping you're going to be able to achieve in year two? Well, the most imminent issue that I think has the potential to, to, to move and I think really, really needs to move is this issue of um, the weighting studies within educational finance, I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, but, um, and I don't know how much time, I'll, I, I'm happy to explain it further, but essentially there's a, you know, a formula that determines how money is distributed to schools around the state and it's determined by the needs of students. And what they've found is that the formula that we've been using for decades now is flawed. And so a lot of schools that have students with tremendous need have been underfunded by the formula. and we know this, it's clear, um, it's, you know, I think it runs against the Constitution. And, um, and so there's a strong effort to um, change those weights. 
and make it right. Um, but as always, it's, it's complicated. And I think there's a real push to make sure that happens. Something happens this year, but certainly it needs to be looked at again next year. Um, my personal, you know, back at the beginning of session when yet another um, black woman stepped down from local politics in Vermont due to racist harassment and, and white supremacy, I came together with a group of other legislators and we wrote a letter and within that letter, public letter, we outlined some action steps that we want to take. Um, and one of them was really doing some organizing internally and within our communities to, to work towards a systemic statewide response to white supremacist terrorism, essentially. And so this is something that I'm going to be spending a lot of my time in between sessions looking at and talking about. And the hope is really to come back in next year with some really concrete ideas, both of how to support our local communities where a lot of this work is going to be happening, but also legislatively, you know, what can we put forward um, to really start finding creative ways of addressing this because uh, it needs to be addressed. And obviously our current laws and law enforcement are not, are not going to be solving this problem. So we need to create some mechanisms for building safer communities for all Vermonters, you know. Uh, and with that, I need to say thank you. And I hope this is merely the first of many years of end, end of session conversations with you. Thank you so much, Kate. On a recent interview show, we talked with Carly in Rutland, who was talking about some exciting changes coming up and a merger between the group in Rutland and Queer Connect in Bennington. So joining me today is the board president of Queer Connect in Bennington, Jess Bouchard. Welcome, Jess. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm delighted that you could make time to share with us. So Harley talked a little bit about the people were looking at merging the group in Rutland and the group in Bennington so you could consolidate resources and offer more to the LGBTQ plus community in the southwestern portion of Vermont. So can you give us a little update on what might be going on? Yeah. Um... So exciting things. Um, Queer Connect obviously was founded in Bennington. And when you are looking at the state of Vermont, um, Bennington is down in the most southern part of the state on the western side. And Rutland is just north of us. Well, not quite just north, but you know, north enough uh, that I think um, we have an interesting pocket of Vermont. And so a lot of the LGBTQ plus um, resources um, you know, they, they benefit all of Vermont, but really we're kind of the forgotten um, <laughs> Southern neighbors. And so our hope was to expand. And so right now we are going through a transition period um, in Queer Connect um, leadership wise, just kind of reshifting. And, you know, we're at a interesting point in our organization that we are coming up on being three. Um, and I think this is kind of the growing pains part of an organization at like the three, right? We're like in the terrible threes um, stage. So with that, the expansion has been great because we have more volunteers, more um, interested folks and Vermont being such a rural place, uh, I think just that expansion has been helpful. I, I, we're starting to see some really um, sleepy towns being interested in, in doing more pride oriented things and LGBT um, you know, Q things. And then also looking for the resources um, because Vermont has such a wide variety of LGBTQ plus resources in other places. It just makes our, you know, our, our expansion, I think um, helpful. So some of the, I guess, some of maybe what you're thinking about is like, what does that mean? Um, that means just like offering more programming. Um, we are going to be supporting Rutland having their first pride in a few weeks here in June, which is exciting. Um, and then just thinking into the future, I think with COVID, uh, that has been an interesting um, <sighs> you know, a uh, challenge for us in like thinking like, how can we truly um, offer resources? So 
as we're expanding, I think it's really stepping back and, and noticing what our community is looking for. I was going to say, th thank you for so much for identifying that you're a part of the state that traditionally can get forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> uh, talking about Southern Vermont, everyone thinks that Brattleboro is part of Massachusetts yeah. and Bennington is part of Albany, New York. Right, exactly. And, <laughs> and people kind of forget that we actually have people living there. Um, <laughs> so you, Michelle, you referenced the Pride event and mm -hmm. it has been a signature piece. And I have been so impressed by what Queer Connect has done relative to Pride. Can you share a little bit about the Pride event that's being planned for this year? And if somebody from the northern part of the state wanted to join in, how they might do that? Yeah, great questions. So um, I would say COVID, we are talking really negatively about COVID, but I also want to talk positively about the digital space. Um, we are going to be offering some online um, events. And so to kick off Pride, which is June, we are going to have three series of Story Hour, which is going to be virtual. And they're all going to have different themes. So someone up north or anywhere, really, if they wanted to sign up, um, you can be a storyteller. And what that is, we'll have a theme. And these storytellers are going to be using their authentic voices to talk about the theme and be a part of the tradition of storytelling, which is so rich and exciting, um, especially when it comes to LGBTQ+. So we're going to have one in June, July, and August. Um, we are actually going to be partnering with different organizations here in Bennington to, um, to co-host. So it's going to be um, two, uh, you know, two hosts so that um, we can show organizations that are supportive and um, have that blend. So the first one, um, I only have one organization right now, but the first one we're hoping will be with the Bennington Performing Arts Center, um, BPAC. Um, so then, you know, that's exciting. Well, we're hoping to have a really, you know, good turnout online and that's going to kick off um, our caravan, which is going to be our, well, I'm going to say we have two big things planned. Um, the first one is in June, June 26, which is our caravan. We're going to have um, two locations. We're going to have um, the caravan starting in Rutland and Bennington. And the hope is that Rutland comes south, we go north, and we meet in Manchester. Um, and obviously being very socially um, distant and um, thoughtful about guidance right now. But last year, it was so overwhelming to see all of the people that came out during such um, an intense, you know, global time that that support was just so lovely. So having the caravan, which means some people on the street cheering us on, but then cars, um, you know, being in this caravan that we can like wave, show our, um, our visibility. Organizations can come in, they can have their signs on their cars. Politicians, we love them, can join in. Anybody who wants to be seen as an ally or anyone who wants to participate, um, that is one way. So that's June 26, which is exciting. And then um, in August, we're gonna have a drag bingo, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> um, so it's gonna be picnic style. Um, you know, you and your loved ones can come and set up a picnic spot on the Park McCullough, which is in North Bennington. Um, it's a mansion, it's really beautiful grounds. We're, um, you know, obviously having, we're co-hosting with them and we're gonna have some drag queens um, just doing their thing and it's gonna be great. <laughs> Okay, so for the picnic, are you encouraging the people attending to also be in creative attire? Ooh, um, you know what? I welcome all of it. If we have some people who want to be in, um, you know, in attendance in whatever they want to wear, I think that's awesome. Um, which inspires me to think like maybe we'll hold a contest, right? Like maybe it will be like bring your best like persona or character or um, costume. Um, I welcome all of that. I love it. <laughs> okay, so that's a special event yeah. that Queer Connect is planning between Bennington and Rutland. I love the idea of the caravan going down from Rutland and meeting in Manchester. Yeah. Now, but you have some ongoing programming that you've been offering. We do. I, as, as I recall, Lesbian Story Hour has yeah. been 
a favorite. So is that still going on? It is. Um, it has been happening every single week for a whole year. We actually just had our year long anniversary. So which means that we had 52 weeks that we, um, we offered this online and um, it is really strong. We've been partnering with um, lesbian authors who are published, who want to read from their book. I actually was one of the readers. I'm a poet. I am not a fiction writer, but I, I had a, um, a night where I read my poetry. Um, so yeah, it's been going really strong. Um, Kay Acker is um, uh, our, our lovely volunteer who has been running it. She's just fantastic, has gotten a lot of great um, readers and then also um, a lot of people participating. We've had people from all over the world. Again, I'm just gonna like plug the digital space of like, we've had people come from Europe and um, from Australia and different places that can attend this because, you know, what a time to be alive, <laughs> you know, when you can connect in this way. So yeah, that is continuing. Um, if anyone is interested, it is every Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I was gonna say going on and looking at some of the events for Queer Connect, you have a virtual healing process that you yeah. routinely offer. Could you share a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so last fall, Lisa and I were really talking and Lisa, Lisa Canton was our um, founder of Queer Connect. And so she and I were talking about how during COVID, LGBTQ plus people especially have been really, um, struggling during this time, you know, um, being, being home, being disconnected, um, you know, especially youth who might be not out to their families or being out to their families and being stuck in. And so we were just thinking about what that means for people. And so healing um, is important for all humans. We all have trauma, all of us in some way. Um, and so we thought, what can we do to offer some type of healing? And so um, I stepped up and I started hosting monthly a healing circle. Um, I'm a Reiki practitioner. So um, in, my, in my real life, um, what does that even mean? In my life. <laughs> so Queer Connect is my real life, but like in my other lives, right, with my other hats, um, I, I do Reiki. I'm also a teacher. Um, so that is, that's my space. And so um, kind of merging those two things of being a teacher and a healer. I started offering these digital, digital, virtual um, uh, healing circles. And so that has been great. Again, I have gotten people from all over the earth. Um, my favorite place was probably, we had someone come from Iceland one time. Um, that was cool. And then a friend of mine, um, a childhood friend of mine uh, jumped in uh, who was at the time living in Australia. So we've had people from all over, actually Ireland, Ireland one, one time too. So what I do during that time is I pick a theme of the month. Um, last month, I'll give you an example was self-care, self-love, com self-compassion. And I write um, some type of guided um, visualization. I just kind of think about, um, you know, what, what does that theme mean to me? And what exactly do other humans need from that theme that could be inclusive? And so I do a visualization. Um, I do a, an opportunity to do some journal writing, um, opportunity to share if we want. Um, I do distance Reiki at the end. So for about 10 to 15 minutes, I just have us meditate and I offer... Um, you know, just my gift of Reiki um, out into the world. <laughs> um, and then we come back together at the end and we really just hold space for each other one last time, set intentions and then go on our way. And then uh, we do it again the next month. <laughs> and is it a particular like thir thir first Thursday of each month or regular schedule? Or do I need to go onto the Queer Connect site to find out where it is, when it is for that month? Yeah. It is now the third Sunday of the month. However, this month I'm pushing it to the fourth Monday, or sorry, sir, I, I, did I say Sunday the first time? I mean Sunday, not Monday. Third Sunday, this month I'm pushing it to the fourth Sunday only because um, I feel like we have a wackadoo like month with like lots of Sundays. And I also need to better prepare um, for for the circle. So I'm pushing it to the fourth. So this is like the first month I've deviated. So thank you for asking that. <laughs> All right, thank you. So you had referenced that Queer Connect is in a period of transition and yeah. you're looking at, you know, 
programs and the organization as a whole, if somebody who is watching this says, you know, I'd like to become more active with an organization and I like the things I'm hearing, what, what might they have the opportunity to do and how would they connect with you? Yeah. So I am always looking for volunteers. I think a nonprofit really values having volunteers, but also can only work because of volunteers. And so um, I would say right now, we, because of the transition that we're going through, I think we're really thinking about our mission statement right now. And the reason we're revisiting it is because we want to make sure that we are serving our community in the right way. And so one of the, I, I would say one of the biggest, um, biggest areas that we are always trying to grow is how we reach our youth. So I'm always looking for youth workers. I'm looking for people who are interested in supporting our youth. Um, I came to Queer Connect because of that aspect as a teacher. Um, I wanted to make sure that my gifts were being utilized. Um, and also as a mom, right, in, in, in Southern Vermont, I wanted to make sure that my, my, um, my children were being um, included um, in the conversation. So I'm always looking for volunteers. So um, people who love working with youth, um, I would love some leadership. Um, you know, I am, I'm new to being a leader. I'm a teacher by trade and I'm new to this. And so I'm always looking for mentors, people who are excited to be leaders and, um, you know, someone I can lean on for, um, to support. Like right now we're filing our taxes. I have never done that um, at this level. So that's really exciting. <laughs> <laughs> right says nobody ever but you know things like that um organizational things so if there is someone in the community who is like Jess Bouchard I would love to help you file taxes or I'd love to support you um in the development side that's great um another skill that I personally have is I'm a grant writer and so I am always looking for other people who just have a good eye for that who um might want to uh, lend their gifts in, in that in that area um and then people who just want more resources. Like, I want to know what does this community want? Because if you want it, we'll get it. But then sometimes I need help to get that. So if someone in the community is like, I would love to be on an LGBTQ, like dodgeball team, that sounds great. And I want to make that happen. But I might need someone who is like a super pro at dodgeball to make that happen. <laughs> so if that answers your questions, um, oh. I want to I want everybody who um, who cares about this conversation. And then you had asked a second question of how can they be in touch? Um, I am checking email regularly. Um, our email is uh, queerconnect at yahoo.com. We also have a Facebook. We also have an Instagram, which I'm on. So I'm just keeping my eyes on those. And with that, thank you for sharing this time with us. Yeah. And I think exactly what you're doing evaluating if you're meeting the needs of your community is something that any organization should be doing on an ongoing basis. So thank you and good luck. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> Most people think of Maine as that ideal place to go to a summer vacation. Think of a conquest, Arcadia. But Maine has been in the forefront of the work on LGBTQ plus equality since 1984. And today, I couldn't be happier that we're having one of those people who are currently working on protecting the rights of LGBTQ Mainers joining us. And this is Representative Ryan Fecto of Biddeford, who also happens to be the out gay speaker of the House of Representatives and the youngest speaker in the country. Welcome, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Really pleased to be here and to have the chance to chat about what's happening here in Maine. I, thank you so much because I know you're still in session, so you're sort of taking breakout from working on bills. I want to talk first a little bit about you. And in your bio, you clearly state that you grew up in Biddeford, 
you grew up in subsidized housing, single mom who worked in healthcare. How did those early years influence your desire to become involved in politics and then the issues for which you advocated? It's a great question. You know, I think my first hands-on experience with politics was when I was a high school student and my superintendent uh, uh, ha had had selected me to be on the school board. And I will never, I will never forget the moment in which the teacher came by the classroom saying, oh, there's this opportunity to be on the school board. And I was, you know, I was a very shy, you know, not very extroverted student and certainly had no inclination about politics or anything of that nature. And for some reason, I felt compelled to put my name into the superintendent's office uh, for consideration. And we did interviews and I'm pretty sure I was chosen because I was introverted and not very outspoken and pretty shy. And they thought, oh, perfect student for the school board. You know, this, this, he's not gonna, he's not gonna cause any problems. Um, and of course I got on the school board and I began to speak, speak out about the things that I thought the school was not doing well, particularly the fact that our school was falling apart. I mean, we had um, a school that was built in the 1960s. It was quite literally falling apart, you know, as, as we were trying to learn. I mean, there'd be days where water infiltration would be so bad that the ceiling tiles would fill up with so much water that they'd come crashing down in the middle of a lesson. Uh, the bottom floor, which was basement level, would fill up with, you know, ankle high water and all the classes down there would have to be moved or canceled for the day. And, you know, I felt it was important that the community make a significant investment in renovating the school. And that's sort of where the activist in me uh, was, was ignited. But the experience I had growing up, as you mentioned, Keith, um, you know, my mom was uh, raised me and my sister. Um, she worked in healthcare. She, she dropped out of high school um, after her freshman year. So she didn't, she doesn't have a nursing degree. She uh, got into healthcare as a low wage healthcare worker. Um, doing the best she could to, you know, put food on the table for me and my sister, relied on on, on what was then called food stamps. Um, and, you know, that experience growing up really had a profound impact on, I think, my worldview and how I, how I see issues today. Um, you know, I am the product of, of, of government providing that little bit of assistance for a family like mine, not, not leaving my family behind, believing that with that with that small investment, um, we can we can change the lives of young people and families across the state of Maine and across the country, and you know that's something that I take to heart. And I think about those kinds of things when we're interacting with all sorts of legislation. You know, food insecurity is a really uh, important issue to me. Uh, I'll never forget um, <laughs> there was a, a night where my mom got a phone call. From a from a fr family friend who said that the JJ Nissen plant was uh, tossing expired food, and you could go up and you know pick pick up the the food that was expired at least for you know the, the, for the shelves at the grocery stores, and so we we went. I don't know why we had to go at night. It was like I remember it being dark. We drive to the plant, and there's just so much food, and you know we fill crates, milk crates up with with bread and pastries and all sorts of things, and we brought that home. And I'll never forget, like you, opening the fridge the next day, and there were all of those Hostess uh, fruit pies in the fridge. And I just remember thinking, "Oh my God! Like we have more food than we've ever had before. We'll never, like, we're never going to go hungry. Like we we are set. We are absolutely set." And of course, you know, you look at the nutritional facts of a Hostess fruit pie now, and you quickly see, you know, saturated fat, sugar, calories, um, not the healthiest thing for a young person growing up, uh, you know, to build a good body and for a healthy mind for learning and all those sorts of things. So when I think about those issues, like those are relatable. Like I, I, I understand childhood obesity. I, I understand what it means to not know when your next meal, what it will be, or, uh, you know, the, 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 every financial crisis, you know, that might be small for the average family, uh, for families like mine, you know, a, you know, a car breaking down, that was, that was like world ending. That felt like a, a bomb being dropped on your fine, you know, your household finances. Um, those, those are the things that I take to heart and certainly inform me in, in the work that I'm doing in the legislature. I was going to say, looking at 
your legislator page, it says that the things that are, are important to you are affordable housing, vocational education, tax fairness, you know, looking at dental care for low income, child care and early ed workplace uh, workforce. But, and I'm gonna come back to that. You referenced being on the school board, but you were also active when you were in college and then came yes. back to Biddeford and in 2014 ran for the house seat and you got 67% of the vote. Ryan, that's an impressive <laughs> vote count. How did you do that? Well, you know, it, it's funny you should mention. So, you know, I took my activism to college as well. I went to yeah. the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., not necessarily uh, the most welcoming place for a, a gay student. Um, and certainly I had, I had uh, you know, put up quite a fight there trying to um, carve out a, a more welcoming space for LGBTQ students on campus. Uh, I, I decided to run for the legislature my senior, uh, the summer before my senior year at Catholic. Um, so I had, a, you know, the whole announcement kind of thing. And, and then I came home pretty much every weekend, my last semester at Catholic. So, and I, and I, you know, I didn't have the luxury of hopping on a plane for, for every flight home. So I, I, I found whatever was the cheapest means to get back home. So I, I, you know, I took the bus from DC up to Boston and then transferred from Boston to Portland or the train, uh, which was definitely the longest of the journeys. Uh, and then of course, plane when they were rather inexpensive flights. And I came home and I knocked doors. I mean, I was knocking doors in January in the cold, uh, which is actually not a terrible plan because most people invite you into their house. And so you get a little bit more face time with them. And, uh, you know, I had real honest conversations with my neighbors, folks that I grew up with, or, you know, parents of those who I grew up with and memes and pepes here in Biddeford and just talked about why I was running, which was young people were moving away. You know, we, uh, behind me is, is, a, is a portrait of uh, the mills in our downtown. They closed in the early, uh, in, the, in, in the turn of the century. And uh, with it went, obviously, the, the heartbeat of our, of our industry and our economy. And then, of course, a lot of families had to move away. And then subsequently, young people didn't see Biddeford as a place where there was opportunity for them. And that was, that's a challenge that is exists across Maine where young people were either choosing to leave or they were graduating from the university of Maine system and seeking employment opportunities outside the state. Cause they didn't see themselves as having opportunity here in Maine. And I wanted to change that because I felt like, you know, I love, I love the state of Maine. I, I loved um, my experience growing up here. And I believe in its future and the ability for us uh, to create a, a strong economy and a place where families can uh, move here and raise their kids and um, really uh, have the opportunities that Maine offers, which is, you know, great recreation, uh, you know, all the places you can possibly dream of going during the weekend, right? Um, hiking and fishing and kayaking and um, all of those great things, the, na the natural beauty of our state the relaxation, um, but we also need to make sure we have economic opportunity. And so that's why I ran. And I had conversations with folks who were probably, you know, 40, 50 years older than me. And I heard over and over again, we need young people to be in office and we need you up there. And so thankful that there's a new face. And uh, obviously you're, you, 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 you said the vote count was uh, 67% and, and obviously voters uh, voters believed in me to be the person to represent them. And obviously six years later, uh, I now have the pleasure of serving as Speaker of the House. They, they not only invited you into their house, they wanted to re for you to represent them in the house. <laughs> so when you were first going out <clears throat> and going door to door, being an openly gay candidate, did that have any impact or was that just sort of a secondary issue for people? Yeah, that, that, that rarely ever came up. I, I do remember one distinct conversation I had with a, you know, very French 
uh, uh, gentleman, you know, probably in his late sixties, uh, owned a business in downtown Biddeford. And he had said something to the effect of, you know, I heard, I heard you were gay. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I am gay. I said, I don't, I, is that, is that, a, is that an issue? And he said, well, no, no, you know, it's not, not a big deal. I said, you know, yeah, the issues I'm fighting for, you know, are making sure that your property taxes don't continue to go up to make sure that we can attract young people back to our state. I said, you know, that's no more of a, of a gay issue than it is a straight issue. I would, I would think. And of course he agreed and we, you know, kind of had a, a chuckle. Uh, and so very rarely did that, did that issue, was it raised as a, as a point of contention, uh, which is, which speaks volumes, I think, to just how much we have, how far we've come, especially if you think about Maine uh, in 2009, we had a, a, a people's veto on marriage equality. Uh, so overturning the law, the legislature passed to, uh, uh, to uh, include same-sex marriage in, in our law. Um, so we, we have a people's veto. It's successful. The law is overturned. Three, three years later, we come back with marriage equality on the ballot again as a referendum initiated by the people. And the vote count basically reverses entirely. From, I think it was 53% in favor of the people's veto. And it reversed 53% in favor of passing marriage equality. Um, and Biddeford, being a Franco-Catholic community, uh, I think was a real, uh, real indicator of the the change of people's perspectives in the uh, not only in their minds but also in their hearts. Uh, people's people began to realize they have family members who are gay, uh, and now they have a state representative who's gay, and I, and I think we really have um, bridged the divide that existed in in understanding. Um, and empathy. Uh, I think that's uh, a big, a uh, big change has, has occurred, but that does not mean the issues have all been addressed. And I think we continue to see some of those, those challenges in the state legislature, and uh, we're going to continue to fight to make things uh, equal. So let's talk a bit about some of those challenges that your legislature is dealing with currently. And it, as I understand it, there are several bills that would prohibit a trans athlete from competing in sports. There is a proposal about trans women specifically being in domestic violence in homeless shelters. Can, can you talk a little bit about those pieces of legislation, what's happening with them? And if you think, my sense from you is that these bills probably don't have a strong likelihood of passage, but you're having to spend time dealing with them. Yeah, it, you know, what's most, <clears throat> what's most disheartening is the impact it has on transgender people in, in the state of Maine, especially young people. Um, to hear the kind of rhetoric that was shared at the public hearing by proponents of these bills um, it's just it's just really disheartening, and uh, you know I I shared on on social media last week when these bills were heard that um, you know and I'm I'm emphatically uh, determined to make sure that these bills are are defeated in the House and I suspect in the Senate as well, and they will not find their way to the governor's desk. Um, these bills are harmful. Um, they they are othering. They make people. Uh, you know, they, they completely ignore uh, the significance of who people are. Uh, it's this idea that just a complete denial that uh, a transgender woman is in fact a woman. Uh, and here in this debate over and over again, referral to uh, biological, biological, biological. And it's, it's just, um, it's just completely, uh, hateful rhetoric and it's it's a it's a matter of trying to divide people and and to try to create that wedge and we're seeing these bills nationwide why are we seeing them nationwide because republicans uh believe that they can uh create a new wedge issue out of the lgbtq community and i i think that they uh i think they've got the pulse of of the public uh wrong i think the public uh, doesn't want to treat people differently, and they don't want to in, uh, to sow hatred into public law. 
um, whether it's dealing with uh, athletes at, at the high school and, and middle school levels and elementary school, or it's dealing with um, uh, how, we, how we make sure that folks who are experiencing homelessness, that they have access to the shelter that they need when they need it. Uh, you know, these are just abhorrent policies and, uh, you know, I'm disheartened that it's the kind of conversation we're having in the legislature, because in the fo- in the six years that I've served now, um, we have not seen uh, legislation that has put the LGBT community, LGBTQ community on the defense. And, uh, you know, just really, really disheartening. And I noticed that one of the bills that you have sponsored is actually in response to that national Republican agenda, and it has to do with voting rights. You introduced a bill to make absentee ballots an ongoing process in Maine. Yeah. So you, you, so I take it there's some competing bills about what happens with vo- voting. Tell me you're the one who's going to win. <laughs> well, well, we've seen the, uh, the annual bill on voter IDs and you know, trying to disenfranchise folks from from voting, uh, those are those are attacks on communities of color. Those are attacks on senior citizens, um, p- persons with disabilities. It's just trying to create barrier. You know, they're they're trying to create barriers across the country. Where obviously we saw what happened in Georgia. Um, they're trying to create barriers to to voting. Um, they want as few folks to be able to vote as possible. And uh, you know, if we're talking about constitutional rights. Uh, I, I wish they would see the constitutional right to vote in the same way that they see the constitutional right to bear arms, you know, uh, it, it's quite, it's quite an interesting contrast, uh, how, how, uh, little that they, they care about making sure folks have uh, every opportunity to cast a ballot, um, across the country. And, uh, yeah, I have a bill that will, uh, allow for municipalities to, uh, send out ongoing absentee voter status to folks. So if I was a voter who basically, you know, pretty much every time I, uh, I vote, I request an absentee ballot, I could enroll with my town and they'll automatically send my ballot to me. So I don't, I don't even have to bother, you know, picking up the phone to make the, to make the phone call. Um, we actually had a pilot program on this back in 2009 and my hometown, Biddeford participated in that pilot. It was incredibly successful. We had, I think around 600 people participate in the program, mainly senior citizens. And, they, they um, provided remarks in a report from the Secretary of State's office back in 2009 um, saying how much they really enjoyed being a part of the program. Of course, the program ended, the law did not continue uh, as, a, as permanent, and so we've been trying to, f- to make this a permanent change to the law. We also have some other great bills, uh, online voter registration, which Maine is a little bit behind on, and and getting up and running, a lot, most states have moved to permitting online voter registration. And there are a number of changes that we made during the pandemic uh, that we now want to solidify into uh, state law as well. So, for example, drop boxes, um, you know, which was a, a small change, but the, the convenience of, you know, being able to just swing by your town office and plop your your absentee ballot into the into the drop box versus, you know, waiting in line when, you know, I don't know how your town office is, but you know, folks are doing other business at town offices. So you, you might wait in line just to hand over your absentee ballot for 15, 20 minutes. Uh, you know, just making sure that we're not creating barriers to, for people to vote. That's the key. Um, and Maine has a great tradition of having you know, a high voter participation. And uh, I'm not gonna settle for being one of the top states already. I wanna continue to move the needle forward so that our voter participation is as high as it possibly can be. And with that, I need to say thank you for spending (laughs) this time with us. Good luck with all the work you are doing and thank you. What I didn't get a chance to talk to you about, so I may have to invite you to come back during the summer, is that Maine has term limits. Yes. So yeah. at the end of your two years as speaker, you cannot run again. A little bit about that. And I definitely would like to talk more about citizens' initiatives and referendums. Yes, definitely. And with that, thank you. Thank you. Pet pancake for me. I definitely will. <laughs>
And, and I will see you soon. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks. But in the meantime, resist. resist.